So I think it should work. Can everyone see it? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Then I start today with the presentation on uh, social contracting. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, uh, concerning uh, the contents, I will contract on. Uh, I will uh, um, uh, concentrate myself on general issues of contracting, social contracting, and specific issues of the new order liberalism. Um, I have um, recognized last week uh, that there is a lot in common uh, with Ubuntu, especially from the normative general perspective. But on this, we have an additional workshop where we can discuss several issues. Um, now it's time to understand uh, the contracting issue um, a little bit more. Um, here is the contents. Today I, I, I have planned uh, the blue issues. I hope that I can do it. Um, Tobias, I have around about 45 minutes time. Is it right? Or less? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Various the black ones which are on the slides, which you can read, uh, is for the, these slides, I will not have the time to do. It's also of a lot of interest for us, but perhaps for a little time, because today I will concentrate on the aspects of social contracting, which might be very interesting for uh, the Wefabi project. So now, um, new order liberalism, and a social sustainability. Um, there exists a lot of modern contractarian approaches, uh, the direct ones which refer to social contracting is very well known. Rawls, Müller, Harshani also exists, Binmore, a lot of others who wrote uh, uh, um, many papers on it. I do not know how many, so it is an issue when you discuss always aspects of normative social policy and social coordination. This means for large groups, for collective action. And indirectly, we see also a lot of approaches which apply the contractarian notion, but which are more interested in a specific issue, just like Van der Wien and Van Paris, which are on um, basic income, but also take care about the basic roles in approach. Uh, <clears throat> these writers and thinkers wrote uh, basically on theory, on theory of social contracting. Yeah, There's also, by the way, Buchan and Nochik and all the others, um, which might be of some interest and social contractarian approach is clearly older but I will not give an overview about the history of social contracting, but more on the scheme. And um, the scheme is easy to um, introduce by explaining the experimental approach and by introducing to the experimental approach of Bolik Oppenheimer from 1992. I clearly always take more time when I, when I introduce into all the prerequisites, crucial assumptions, and so on of the theory, the experimental test is, with some respect, very shy on fulfilling all the prerequisites, but he shows directly what uh, uh, the aim of the approach is. Yeah. So therefore, I will introduce into that. Um, very often we have also experiments and uh, econometric uh, introductions into the issue of UBI by implicitly uh, applying um, also um, a test of the social contract. Colombino has done this, for example, by comparing different social welfare functions. Social welfare functions are different to social contracting because social contracting tries to define endogenously, uh, if you wish to say that the social welfare function, whereas social welfare function approaches in itself um, come from heaven by some certain arguments on them, but you do not decide on them. 
the philosopher or the economist argue you should apply them. So social welfare function approach is a top-down approach where an elite said we should employ it, whereas the social contracting approach is based on unanimous agreement on the basic rules of the social contract. This is exactly the idea, for example, of James Buchanan. And James Buchanan was for UBI very interesting in terms of uh, um, UBI, um, because he argued uh, there could be a constitutional democrat, a payment for everyone, which could be useful out of two arguments. He didn't write it down explicitly, but implicitly. The first is, the problem is that uh, many individuals, especially very powerful in day-to-day -day politics, try to manipulate strategically the political agenda. That's the argument of Le Leto Meadows referring to Pew Cannon and to avoid this by um, implementing a constitutional democrat, whereas uh, my approach, Neumarker, is more on the Buchanan idea that you, if you pay everyone a sufficient amount, then they will not only agree on the constitutional, on the social contracting rules, but they will also comply to them after signing the contract. Yeah. Uh, by the way, a nice scheme was developed by Tony Atkinson in his book in 1995, on the contractarian constitutional logic for UBI. This was based on theory. And um, myself also uh, then combined uh, these approaches in several publications, especially with respect to the ex post stabilization of the social contract of the governance mode. You will see what that means. And I call all these combinations of different aspects of social contracting on UBI than new auto liberalism. So the Atkinson approach is very simple. He argues in the contractarian stage, in the constitutional choice, you could decide between a typical um, um, a social insurance scheme, yes, for example, a means tested scheme financed by graduated taxation by some income tax or some value added tax or specific tax. Uh, and this on this could be voted in the contractarian, in the constitutional stage against the idea of a UBI. This means the UBI may be also financed uh, by taxes, but then it is clear that these are not specified ex expenditures based on different uh, needs of individuals, everyone receives the same amount. If he's rich, poor, needy, or young, old, or uh, 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 retired, or so, it doesn't matter. So in the political machinery, after the constitutional choice, in the post-contractarian, post-constitutional choice, in the UBI scheme, you can decide on the level of the tax rate. Uh, for example, if you assume income tax, as uh, income taxation, as uh, Tony Atkinson uh, did it, and he specified it with a, with a flat tax, yeah? uh, with a, a unique tax rate, various then in the, uh, in, uh, if uh, on the constitutional stage, you, uh, on the contractarian stage, you decide on a specific um, workfare, a, a means tested, needed based, uh, social insurance system, you decide on the level of tax rates and also in addition in a complicated system on the different um, benefits uh, of the social insurance system. Yeah, uh, so therefore you see the, uh, the contractarian or constitutional choice is UBI versus the social insurance system. Um, you could also call his idea of UBI more or very nearby a negative income tax, yes. And then you could decide on UBI, which may be financed not by an income tax, but by a, a value added tax um, or other taxes versus the NIT, totally integrated UBI system versus a totally disintegrated social insurance graduate taxes system. On the post-constitutional level, from the viewpoint of Atkinson, 
you decide only on the tax parameter, on the tax rate, uh, for example, on the marginal tax rate system, on the tariff, uh, tax tariff, and on the public expenditures on the social uh, insurance system. Uh, you could also, by the way, that was ignored by uh, Atkinson, decide in the constitutional stage, as Buchanan did it, on tax rates or on uh, expenditure systems also. So therefore, you see, uh, the Atkinson system is one, but you can vary it uh, uh, along the ideas of Buchanan and others. And by the way, it was very interesting for me to see that a more left-wing thinker like Tony Atkinson, who wrote a lot about inequality and redistribution, and who is perhaps the, uh, uh, the thinking father, the, the uh, inspirator of uh, Thomas Piketty, um, applied a system of a more, say, conservative right-wing thinker like James Buchanan. And I said, oh, this is very interesting when individuals from the left-hand side, from the middle range and from the more conservative side are interested in one scheme in the UBI and how to finance it from a contractarian point of view, this should be very interesting because this could mean that we can integrate certain ideological ideas and orders into one contractarian scheme. So from the traditional social contracting research, um, the idea is that in the contractarian stage, you decide ex ante on the rules, and then you play the game inside the rules. Yeah? <clears throat> so the social contract is on the parameters of the social insurance, on the social policy system. Is it UBI or not? Is it tax system or not? Then you may fix some parameters or not, depending on the will of the decision makers in the constitutional stage and inside that set of the rules the individuals decide. My problem with that was also, you will always, you will see it on the next slide, that I uh, do not believe in the fact that if you have decided on the rules, that the individuals will always comply to the rules, that the rules are always uh, effective, this means in action, and that they uh, will be always um, applied. Yeah? So I had three arguments against it. First, that there might be uh, an ex post justice problem. You will see the ex ante contract solves an ex ante social, uh, ex -ante -social justice uh, problem. Uh, Please decide on the rules on which you believe that they may be just, efficient, sustainable, resilient, and so on and so forth. Yeah, And there might be a different justice criterion which comes from ex post, for example, is a society envy-free or blame-free. And this means that the ex post justice can be in struggle with the ex ante justice, and then the ex ante justice cannot be enforced in the ex post world because the individuals in the extreme case may, by unanimous agreement, vote against the ex ante just rules. Who should enforce the ex ante just rules? No one will do this inside the rule setting. Yeah? Then the constitution, the social contract, will break down. Second, a problem is that especially um, very political influential groups, yeah, the so-called interest groups, the, uh, the lobbyists may manipulate the rules. They will not change the rules, but they will manipulate the rules in a way which are for their own sakes and against the interests of others. Therefore, they will strategically manipulate the rules. They will so-called by Buchan and others erode the rules. This means then the rules are not strategy proof. How to solve ex post strategy proofness that the individuals in the ex ante stage know the rules on which we have made the decision are strategy proof. Individuals cannot manipulate them. Third, uh, can we be sure that the rules on which we have made the decision are then um, <clears throat> uh, are then um, um, 
um, um, um, um, renegotiation proof or in the best way self-enforcing. Yeah, um, this means that the rules are uh, developed in a way that after setting the rules, everyone has an interest in following the rules. Then it is self-enforcing. This means you can concentrate on a hierarchical flat um, um, policy, yes, uh, because everyone will uh, uh, comply to the rules, so therefore you do not need an external enforcer or a post-constitutional enforcer. If the rules are not self-enforcing, then you have to generate a renegotiation proofness by a governance constraint, yes, that you have uh, individuals who have the hierarchical enforcement power, uh, which you delegate. That's the idea, for example, of Buchanan's Leviathan and many other approaches for indirect democracy, that you delegate enforcement power so that the constitution, the social contract is still stable. And these three issues define what I call social sustainability. The co social contract, the rules on which we have done our ex-ante contracting are durable, st stable, and if we need a, a governance constraint, then self-enforcing does not work. If we have proof this, that then the state has enough capacity, this means enough power to enforce the rules. This is then social sustainability, which is clearly totally different from ecological sustainability. And my arguments, which I will not develop here further on, are if you want to have ecological sustainability, that's very important for water, energy, food security, then you need a gardening of social sustainability uh, so that ecological sustainability without social sustainability does not work so that the overlap of ecological sustainability and social sustainability should be 100% in the best cases. So the ex post constraints define now new order liberalism, N-E-O-L, N-O-L, social contractual sustainability, as I guess, and therefore uh, new order liberalism requires that a social contract um, explicitly solves the ex post constraints on the ex ante contractarian state and not only assumes or requested as the traditional um, social contract thinkers always claim it. Yeah, uh, Farnberg, Buchan and others said uh, the individuals have to comply. They assume it, they have to comply. It's a prerequisite. They have to comply. If they do not comply, it's allowed to punish them. But uh, if there is no punishment rule, yes, which takes care, this means a governance rule, uh, which takes care uh, that the individuals will comply to the rules, then uh, this means an explicit solution, then the contract will not be socially sustainable. So therefore, we always have to explicitly solve it in the ex ante uh, stage by the expectancy what could happen in the ex post stage. And therefore, you see, it's very important what uh, idea and what meaning, um, um, what uh, a feeling you have about how the ex post contractarian stage could look like. Yeah, this is very important for the governance mode because if you say I do not like and do not know if unforeseen contingencies can occur, or if I know in the contractarian stage that writing such a complex constitution is too expensive, or that the enforcement of a constitution in the post-constitutional in the post-contractarian world is too expensive then I write an ex post constitutional rule, which helps me even when I do not know uh, that uh, the contract is not perfectly designed so that he can take care about all circumstances which might apply in the future, because I do not know all circumstances. So therefore, pacta sunt servandas is, insufficient, uh, is an insufficient argument for social contracting.
Now, the argument of how to um, 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 develop in a normatively uh, a useful and a sophisticated way a social contract, yeah, that's now the theory, yeah, we have to fulfill some requirements on what a good social contract is. Yeah, that's very important. And this can be shown by uh, developing the structure of the experiment of Rolik Oppenheimer. Uh, you will see some arguments, the experts will see some arguments of informational requirements will be missed. Uh, 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 and ignored in my uh, arg in my argumentation here, but I could uh, uh, add them whenever it's needed. But I think it's more important to understand social contracting. The importance of social contracting is that you generate impartiality. Why? Because if you generate impartiality, then you argue, if I see all the positions of different individuals, and I'm impartial to any position of the individuals, I decide fairly on the different positions. And if everyone in the contracting stage will do this, then we have a fair decision. And if we do that on, for example, redist uh, on the distribution of goods, of commodity bundles, or uh, as it is usually done on income, then we can argue such a social contract is a fair contract because it's based on impartial decision-making. The situation of impartiality, which is usually based, standard economists do that. You will see if I have the time, I will develop a behavioral argument, which uh, may be added to see that you give more structure to the contractarian stage than it is usually given is that it is based on rational self-interested individuals also in the contractarian stage. And they will choose uh, uh, impartially. That's very important. Um, one moment. Um, so you see here impartial. So there is the so-called wheel of uncertainty or wheel of ignorance where you do not know in which one position you will be in the future. And then John Harshani said, you will decide on your expected utility with regard to any position E, with, uh, yeah, with any utility of uh, any position E, and therefore you maximize expected utility in terms of the sum of all future positions, in terms of utility. Various roles argued uh, you are risk averse in the constitutional stage, highly risk averse, therefore you would like to ensure by the contractarian stage the worst of position in the society, therefore you try to maximize the worst of position, the minimum of all utility positions which might exist, therefore the worst of position. <laughs> yeah? And how to decide between these two approaches and even other approaches that's the idea of the experiment. Because you see here, if individuals are risk averse in the contractarian stage, then they would vote for Rawls. If they are more risk neutral, then they would vote for Harshani. Uh, this is highly related to inequality aversion. Uh, and therefore, it may depend on the constitutional, on the contractarian preferences. And this is also very important uh, for a decision about deciding between water, energy, food security, and foreign aid basic income in a country just like um, Namibia. Yeah? If the individuals there are more risk averse or more inequality averse, and what they would like to maximize whenever they are impartial. Impartial does there mean it doesn't matter uh, from which of the Namibian tribes they are coming, if they are living in Windhoek or in smaller villages in the north, in the south, or whatever. Therefore, you will see when um, um, uh, Tobias will contribute to the experimental issues from a normative point of view, uh, it makes sense 
to organize the experiments in communities where there might be differences uh, in, in, in these choices, which we would like to recognize if we can find a, a, a unanimously a scheme for the whole Namibian country, or if we need schemes for be, being resilient in terms of social sustainability and also ecological sustainability. This means water, energy, food security yeah, in different communities, perhaps differently from the viewpoint of uh, the development land. So we have a procedure that I said with imperfect uh, information. Individuals do not know too much about the future. If they can uh, apply subjective probabilities or not is another issue. That's the difference between Harshani and, um, and um, uh, Ross, but we can test it in a very simple scheme. And what is important for the computerized experiments. Why I like them, because to find unanimous agreement, it's a contract. In the contract, by definition, you have to find unanimous agreement. Everyone has to sign the contract. Here, the citizens have to sign the contract. It's a bottom-up contract by the will of the people, which we would like to try to identify by the request of impartiality and unanimous agreement. For that, it's very interesting to see the chat protocol. This means the chatting in which the, the individuals try to find their unanimous agreement, what arguments survive the test of unanimous agreement. Would they like to have a lot of water or and energy or and food security? Or would they like to get the money to buy water, energy, food then, and uh, security will come out of the markets? or whatever, yeah? That's what we can see when individuals have to argue on different rules, which are uh, pre-set in the experiment and on which they will decide by the uh, prerequisite of unanimous uh, agreement under impartiality. And the idea of impartiality is very simple, yes? Can individuals reach a unanimous agreement Will they vote more for utilitarianism or vote more for the Rawlsian uh, uh, taking care about the worst of position? Or will they uh, choose another principle, for example, a UBI, which does cover some um, um, uh, basic issues, some basic needs, but not maximize the basic needs of the poorest individuals, yes? And then it's very important to repeat these experiments to see if one or another principle is surviving uh, the uh, experimental test repeatedly. If you do that in one experimental repetition or if you uh, repeat the experiment depends on uh, the design on the experiment uh, in itself. And then the end would be, okay, we have a very robust rule. This seems to be a good rule for Namibia. And then we can see uh, if the donors should pay uh, the development aid in terms of a basic income for any, um, for any citizen of Namibia, for example, or for different villages differently, or for different regions differently, and how to combine this with water, energy, food security payments, or should they pay direct investment more on water and or energy and or food? Yeah, by the way, with this experiment, we can also see if the individuals have a hierarchy towards food, energy, and or water. Yes, this might be also very interesting. So the unanimity rule and the chat protocols then show us in the experiment what the probands uh, try to uh, stabilize as a rule, which they would find a very clever one for the specific problem with which they are confronted in such a contractarian, um, um, contractarian experiment. So you see here in the experiment, we have a trade-off between high income, for example, yeah, basic income and market income. 
yeah, or other specific social benefits in the country, and the idea of uh, the best insurance against the worst case to be the poorest individual in a society. This means this problem deals with risk. We can have also a trade off be between the highest and the lowest income, not the insurance issue, that this then deals with inequality issues. Uh, then we can deal with the trade off between a marginal basic income. This means in the end, no basic income. Yes, that the worst of individual is very, very poor. This can be the case usually under utilitarianism, where any inequality is allowed as long as it serves the sum of all utilities uh, numbers of, of all uh, income. Yeah, or if you would like to maximize the highest payment uh, here, for example, the highest basic income which is possible, this would then rolls a uh, Philippe van Parij uh, scheme. Yeah? And the results, once again, should be robust to yield a generally valid theory. You see, by the way, compared to Ubuntu, and that's what we have to work out in our workshop, is there are a lot of uh, 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 parallel lines toward that universalism, universalistic uh, requirements of the theory of uh, the experiences uh, on which Ubuntu is uh, developed and on this pure theory and on the experiments of social contracting. There is a lot I think we can integrate and then we can test Ubuntu as an approach, a social, a specific social contracting approach supported by basic income, not supported by basic income, supported by another social insurance benefit system, yeah, and to see which one of these systems on these payment systems will survive, yeah. And out of the chat, we may also develop some resilience and non-vulnerability arguments, which should be included or excluded from the social contract chain approach. In the experiment, which I will now show very shortly, um, sorry, uh, we have four different schemes. The Rawlsin scheme, maximize the worst of. The Hashani scheme, maximize the average, because the average means you maximize the sum of all incomes, measuring indirectly utility distribution, or you may maximize the average so that there exists a certain income floor, a certain UPI, or you may maximize uh, an income floor and an income ceiling that means you take care in the contractarian stage also about uh, uh, inequality so that you are inequality averse, uh, whereas the Rawlsin scheme measures more the risk aversion. So, and clearly the, uh, um, uh, uh, the contractarian interest in basic income could be, um, could it be um, uh, in the range between the Harshani approach, which is, by the way, maximizing GDP, yeah, what we have done for many, many years in the Western world in our capitalistic approach, maximizing GDP. Yeah, in Germany, yesterday we said, oh, we have only one point, uh, sorry, 0 0.1 increase in basic, in, uh, in basic income, that would be good, <laughs> in GDP, therefore our performance is not very good. We measure our performance always in GDP and all the other things are restrictions. GDP is the measure. So therefore the, uh, uh, the German uh, uh, con uh, constitution is based implicitly on a social contract in the Hashani mode, maximizing GDP. That's very, that's very uh, clear. And you can transfer any of these approaches to a basic income scheme, therefore is also of interest. You see here the schemes yeah, on which you have to decide by unanimous agreement. You have different income classes and different schemes. The scheme number one, you see it directly, maximizes the average is not good for the worst of called low with $12,000 of income, say Namibian dollar, for example, yeah, and the highest one, the richest one had 32. These are only assumptions. 
This has nothing to do with reality. In our experiments for Namibia, we want to uh, uh, do real numbers, but these real numbers, especially with respect to uh, the development aid, which, for example, Germany or the whole world is paying to Namibia and how to distribute the uh, development aid. That's then a little bit different uh, to this scheme here. Yeah, then you see scheme two. Scheme two is of interest because the average is lower than the first one and the third one, but the basic income is higher than the first one scheme. Yeah, and it's lower than the third one scheme. That's very interesting um, because clearly you see the range is the highest in uh, by the highest average. This means this maximizes GDP, the sum of all income, yeah? but therefore the range is very high. The range in the third scheme is also very high, 17, but the basic income is higher than in the second. This could happen uh, because we have hidden behind the schemes different um, um, tax tariffs and therefore different incentives to work. And in the third theme scheme, the incentive to work is higher for the high income classes. And for medium low, this means losses, for example. Yeah. And therefore, the difference between scheme two and scheme three shows that with a higher basic income, but a higher range, the individuals are not so much inequality averse than if they would vote unanimously. Yeah under the impartiality on scheme number two, then they are highly, comparatively, highly uh, inequality arose because they accept a lower basic income because the range is lower than under scheme number three. Scheme number four, you see, the average is the lowest one because it costs the society a lot yeah, to finance the relatively high amount of the worst of individual, here 15,000, and the other ones have a lot of disincentives to work. That's the big uh, issue here. Therefore, the range is low. This means uh, inequality is low. The basic income is the highest one, which is possible, yeah, uh, but the average is the lowest one. So therefore, it means uh, the GDP is relatively low. On which one? the society would vote on this. The interesting thing for the experiments in Germany is in other countries, no one voted on scheme number one. So therefore, in the experiments, the probands find a unanimous agreement that they do not like maximizing GDP. That is the norm which we usually assume in the Western world. And then we have some constraints, say social benefits and so on and so forth. But first, we take care about GDP, because out of GDP, we finance the restrictions. And you do see here from a bottom-up experiment, no one would vote on this. So um, I will uh, argue uh, first the, that this social contracting is not artificial at all for normative po political discussion because many argue you will never see a social contracting stage in the world. As some American philosophers argue at the beginning in US, yeah, when we had all these uh, horse riders with the meeting in Washington, I guess, from the different states, they were in a position of uh, impartial uh, reasoning on the US constitution. So therefore it was nearby, but with the experiment, it doesn't matter because you simulate impartial reasoning. And if there is one rule, for example, the rule of fair fairness called per pay payments in accordance to economic performance, and you see that this rule always is ruled out in the social contract, then you can argue this is not a fairness principle because it will never be uh, decided on in, an, uh, in, a in a social contract under impartiality and unanimous agreement. So therefore, this rule 
which is a basic rule for GDP maximization, is, for example, ruled out constantly. So therefore, you can argue social contract experiments are very important to derive soundful and sound um, norms uh, for uh, social policy and for fair collective decision making and for fair outputs, uh, for example, income distribution in a society. Um, <clears throat> now, because I have only a little bit of time, I will argue that the sequential logic in the chat has also shown uh, by the chat very often in experiments in 2012 up to 2013 that individuals argue with basic income first that they would like to be insured against uh, that they are losers in the market economy. So, you know, the market economy is usually the formal market economy, so to speak. That's very important because in Namibia we are more in an informal market economy than in a formal market economy. Justice is more important than efficiency. Efficiency, this means formal market economy only if everyone receives a basic income so that individuals can participate always in this society, yes, in a fruitful way. This means compared to the social market economy in Germany, we would have an argument out of social contracting and social contract experiments for a paradigm shift. This means namely justice first and not, um, and not uh, efficiency first. And justice first is then covered by a certain basic income, not by maximizing the worst of position or other things, but at least by a basic income, which guarantees participation in a society and then the risky way of a, a competitive market economy can be added to this basic income society. So um, two arguments, not take care about this a PD game too much because this is highly uh, difficult to introduce into shortly. You may perhaps know the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and this is very important for, the, for uh, one aspect of the new order liberalism, namely the strategy proofness. Usually we know from the prisoner's dilemma that individuals uh, choose not to cooperate, to defect, this means not to do common action or to provide common, say, public goods, yeah, because they know the other one will show free right of behavior on my own contribution, because this will give him a net higher value than if he would also contribute to the provision. Um, Matthew Rabin has shown in many, many experiments that this pure rationality assumption of uh, mainstream economists is not so easy to be transplanted to real life because individuals take care in societies what feeling they have to other individuals, for example, to the neighbor. The argument for a prisoner's dilemma game me, might be if you are nice and you cooperate, then I am also nice. Yeah? And if you defect, I am meaningful to you, I also will defect. This means if you defect, I will punish you. If you cooperate, I will give you an extra benefit. And it is the same for the other individual also. So that cooperation by this ethical disposition uh, pays more. Yeah, we had this rule, by the way, as a normative standard in many ethics and even religions, yes? <laughs> if you do not want uh, uh, to do something uh, I should not do to you, then do not do it to me. That means if you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. If you mean to me, I mean to you. Yeah, we know this from many religions that they have this rule integrated, especially um, <clears throat> from, um, from the Jewish, Jewish tradition, we have that. So uh, what this scheme can show that, sir, that only under a certain parameter of this um, 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 ethical value here called alpha, 
This can be shown under different parameter values, only with a different value, which is an empirical issue, individuals will cooperate. And the interesting thing is, if the individuals decide in the constitutional stage where they do not know uh, what the ethical factor is, assume here in that game, you can read it because I will send the, the, the slides to Tobias so therefore he can distribute it to everyone who would like to see them. And uh, this factor alpha can be um, empirically distributed by unanimic, uh, unanimously uh, dist uh, unanimously uh, probability distribution between one and two, yes, so therefore for any um, parameter value, the probability might be the same between one and two, then uh, there exists one expectancy parameter on which the individuals can decide um, which is needed by a certain basic income level this is here 0.75 of in utility, in payments, in payoffs, yes, so that any conditional cooperation scheme can be transferred towards an unconditional cooperation scheme. This means if the individuals would like to play an Ubuntu society, that basic income may help to support cooperation in the terms of the Ubuntu society, um, yes, therefore, basic income might help to organize a society, an African society, towards the way of Ubuntu. Yes, that's very interesting because the individuals will then cooperate unconditionally. Clearly, for that, we have to set also the financing scheme and so on. The experiment will be much more complicated, but that's the way in which we can think. Last argument. Here on renegotiation proofness, what, how can the basic income also help? Yeah, if it is Ubuntu or not is another question. Yes, that a certain set of rules may be stable. This means renegotiation proof. Oh, by the way, I forgot it. Here, um, if um, if the system is then unconditional uh, cooperative, this means no one has the incentive to strategically manipulate the scheme by defection. That's the argument that the scheme is then strategy proof. Everyone plays cooperation because the basic income payment exists. Yeah? No one will, will vote defection out of his strategic disposition because he knows the other one will also strategically decide towards defection. Yeah? Strategic manipulation is excluded. Okay, and here the idea of Buchanan is if you have an agreement on an ex ante fair rule, take on an ex ante set of fair rules, so ex ante fair social contract, then take care about that no one will uh, depart uh, from this contract in the, con the post-constitutional stage. Departure means, for example, when you breach the contract and others might follow you, then you move back to the pre-contractarian stage, which might be, for example, anarchy. Yeah? And to um, avoid that individuals erode the constitution back towards anarchy so that um, the contract is not renegotiation proof, you pay to everyone the highest anarchic level towards everyone, the highest anarchic level, which you can identify in the contractarian stage. Why? Because then you are sure that the worst of individual, yes, which might have the highest anarchical level, which you do not know in the contractarian stage, because you will not know if the individual with the highest anarchic level will be in the post-constitutional stage, a rich one, a medium one, or a low one, yes, will still comply to the constitution because even if he is the worst of, yeah, his level is still higher than the highest level under anarchy. So therefore he will comply to the constitution, making the constitution renegotiation proof. Okay, so therefore you see a uh, new order liberalism will contribute towards the contractarian arguments. The contractarian arguments 
might be very interesting to find a, a, a important schemes for testing the uh, uh, optimal foreign aid for Namibians from a bottom-up point of view. This means that the recipient, this is also important for renegotiation proofness, the recipient can tell um, the donator, yeah, for example, the German people, what they really need to participate in economy, in politics, in globalization, and so on and so forth. Therefore, the province have to be the citizens of Namibia and the donators are the ones who can say how much money we could give to you, but not how the money should be distributed and in what the money should be invested. That's what the Namibians have to do. Yeah? And you see here, the approach is universalistic yeah? in a way that it depends only on the schemes you have in mind, which you would like to test in a social contract experiment. And then we can identify in a normatively sound way what kind of social contract, what kind of foreign aid constitution the Namibians would like to see to help them as best as it can help. Thank you very much. Um, and now uh, the floor is open for um, for questions. You have to unmute. I still cannot hear you. <laughs> Könnt ihr mich jetzt hören? Yes. Okay, da hat sich was umgestellt. So, uh, sorry for the interruption. So, yeah, the best way to do the question and answer session is maybe we, um, you raise your hands or you unmute yourself if you see that nobody wants to ask a question. Uh, so, um, so that we can go in a, in the flow of discussion and uh, arguments and uh, feel free, don't be shy. And I will stop the recording now. Thank you. <laughs>